Welcome back to Our Canada, Our Future. We're talking reconciliation with Karen Rastoul, CEO of Shared Value Solutions and a member of the Doki's First Nation. Uh, Karen, we're going to talk about the Indian Act, which I know is an issue near and dear to your heart. I think we need to start at the sort of 10,000 foot level though, because I think most Canadians, they have a vague awareness about what the Indian Act is, but not much more than that. So I guess if you could uh, educate us, what is the Indian Act and why is it so important? So this piece of legislation dates back to 1876. Uh, what people don't know is that it kind of married a bunch of ad hoc policies that uh, the folks at the time uh, who were governing uh, on these lands uh, amalgamated. Uh, into one beautiful piece of legislation that in my view, uh, beautiful being sarcastic of course, that in my view uh, over the years has done way more harm to us as a country than good. Uh, the original intent um, was to support the treaties that had been signed throughout the 1800s that worked to keep Indigenous people contained uh, within specific borders so that they wouldn't get in the way of Western expansion efforts uh, and eventually, uh, you know, was amended and edited over a course of time and in its current form today in 2022 um, it has for objective to manage registered Indians governments and lands um, so in my view I don't know that it's achieved uh, any of its objectives uh, with with you know seeing where things are uh, where they are today I think there's an opportunity to correct the course here and um, you know and do policy better now, you're certainly not the first person to criticize the Indian Act. In fact, there seems to be criticism clear across the political spectrum uh, about the Indian Act. As you say, it's been around almost as, as long as Canada has been around. Um, so I guess the question is, why has there been no major reform to the Act um, in that, that period, especially if everyone can agree that the Act itself is a problem? Well, it has served a purpose. Uh, and to some extent, it did allow for Western, uninterrupted Western expansion. Um, you know, did it, did it succeed in assimilating every Indigenous person into the quote-unquote Canadian fabric? I would argue no. Um, uh, but uh, like you say, Aaron, the thing's been around for 146 years. Canada and the state that we know it has been around for 155 years. And it's a bit, it's a bit puzzling how we've been you know, governing uh, quote unquote indigenous affairs uh, with the same strategy for 146 years. I mean, even the constitution has been revisited uh, in 1982. So it, it's a bit of a head scratcher. Uh, some thoughts, I think change is hard and scary, even if it means it's going to be for the better. Um, I think the act codifies, as I mentioned, uh, treaties. Uh, and without a serious discussion on how to implement those treaties in the modern times, uh, I don't know that there's an appetite yet to get rid of that Indian Act. I see. Um, so I guess I put to you then specifically, I mean, you must have some views on what a post-Indian Act relationship between Canada and Indigenous Canadians would look like. Do you have any sort of broad principles or, or things that you would like to see if we are able to ever move forward uh, past the Indian Act? Yeah, so it, it's 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 actually more um, realistic and within reach than Canadians would like to think. When we look at what's going on in, in British Columbia, in the territories uh, throughout even to uh, northern Quebec there, there's some modern agreements that have been in place for quite some time uh, that include uh, 40 or so communities. Um, and while these agreements are heavily criticized for not being perfect in the sense that they don't achieve sovereignty for those nations, uh, I believe they are a step in the right direction, help to support uh, self and local government. Um, and, and they're definitely a step in the right direction. Now, the question is, what about the other 590 plus First Nation communities in the middle uh, of the country? We're talking about pretty much a territorial uh, span that covers, you know, half half of the country uh, landmass. So it's pretty significant. Um, you know, these are treaties that are called <laughs> named historic treaties. But you know, as a beneficiary of Robinson Huron Treaty, uh, I, I don't think it's historic at all. Uh, this treaty is still alive and well and continues to govern, uh, quote unquote, uh, you know, secure my way of life, my community's way of life, and the way of life of other Canadians within this territory. So. 
it's on the government, on the leaders of today and tomorrow to set up a policy framework that, that allows for those negotiations to happen. What do these treaties look like in modern application and how are we going to work together to implement them and respect them? Yeah, great thoughts, Karen. Uh, we're going to take a very short break and we're going to be back again after this short break. <laughs> 